Behind the Brand features the people who are making things happen. Get the insight to grow your biz from experts who've done it. Get Behind the Brand. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with Jeff Hazlett, former CMO of Kodak, author of Running the Gauntlet, and entrepreneur businessman extraordinaire. Jeff, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? Well, it's not an easy road. I don't think you start off going, say, hey, I want to be here at this time in your career. You just kind of get on a horse, as I say, in South Dakota and just start riding. And that's how I got there. You know, I went from a small public relations firm. I owned a number of businesses. I've started a number of businesses. I bought hundreds of businesses in my career and then went out to work in the C-suite of a Fortune 100 company. So, And now back to being an entrepreneur again, an investor and board member. So it's a lot of fun. A lot of people watching this show, you know, they're small business owners, they're entrepreneurs. Maybe for those who don't know the backstory, how'd you get started? You know, how'd you get to kind of where you're today? Yeah, I really started off in politics very early on and was working in campaigns and then decided to go hang up my shingle and start a public relations firm, which I did in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I mean, I have offices in in New York and L.A. and then Sioux Falls, and people say, why? And I say, because I can. And it's exotic. It's exotic. I mean, who, yeah, I mean, have you been there? Most people have never been there, just like (laughs) they've never been to Tahiti, maybe. But uh, it's a lot like that. And, uh, you know, it's just a, a different kind of, a way of doing it. But I got started very early on and just put up a shingle, started my basement of my home, I eventually grew that to a, you know a couple hundred employees, bought a printing company, bought a television station, and just have gone ebbed and flowed. And there's no difference you know, between being on Main Street in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and Wall Street in New York City. The only difference is the numbers of zeros behind the numbers you have. So if you got 27 employees, say, in Sioux Falls, you got 27,000 in New York. It's the same problems, just more of it, you know? Yeah. Have you always been a marketer? Yeah, I've always been a person who sells and markets or pushes and promotes. I, I've always been that. I've always been overly optimistic, and I've always had the ability to be able to, to look at things very quickly, see the issues, and then focus on solutions for them, and then hopefully amplify and take, you know, take advantage of whatever the situation is. So I've always been that kind of person. I like to fix things, and that's always been really good for me, and that's why I always tend to come back to the roots of being at marketing or being in public relations. So how can smaller companies, people maybe just getting started with their brand, leverage social media think? What's it good for? Well, I I talk about it in the book, Running the Gauntlet. I talked about it in my first book, uh, The Mirror Test. Uh, And that's really about having a strategy. What's your strategy? What do you want to do? I call it the four E's. You know, first of all, get engaged. You know, start doing it. I mean, this is, again, the biggest use of OPM you'll ever have. And and a lot of small business owners think, why? It's not for me. It's about, you know, reading about people's lunch or dinner. It's no, it's not. So start being your own chief listing officer. This is a, a, a thing I put in at Kodak and um, first one ever. No one had ever done it. I, I outlined the concept in the book because, you know, I think more companies are going to be doing it. It's a phenomenon that you're seeing. So you had one designated person, or were there more, yeah, with well, their ear to the ground? Yeah, at, at Kodak we had one. There were more, but there was one person, not to act like a, you know, an air traffic control. well, to act like an air traffic controller, but not to listen to every conversation because you're doing it in 100 20 countries and 40 different languages, there's no way one person can stay up 24 hours a day every day and watch. So it's really to to have a system for that. Now, if you're an entrepreneur, well, you're not only the CEO, but you're also the guy cleaning the toilets and, and, and taking care of filling up the copy machine, and you got to be listening. Right. And that's what you should be doing. So it's, it's an emphasis on listening. Because if you're listening to your customers, which is something we should be doing all the time. I heard recently at a sales conference, someone actually said, well, listening is the new thing. I said, when did it ever stop being the old thing You know, for entrepreneurs? It's, it's always been about listening to your customer because if you listen to them, they'll tell you what to do. But again, back to this social media, what's your strategy? And I talk about the four E's, about getting engaged, about about educating, about getting people excited, and then, then they start to evangelize or become brand ambassadors. And that's it's really that simple. I mean, this isn't a difficult kind of concept to grasp. It's just about getting into it. And if you're genuine, transparent, and real, it'll come back to you. What are some of the tools that you recommend? People are using Twitter now. Yeah. People understand Facebook. Google Plus, we were talking about LinkedIn and some of these others. You know, obviously you should be using, like, if you're on BlackBerry, Uber, Twitter, uh, you know, to be able to follow a little bit more along those lines. But then, you know, TweetDeck and and then there's some other great tools like Chirpaloo. I don't know if you've heard of that, but that's a great way to automate uh, messages out to your Twitter following. So if you, you know, like myself, 50, 60,000 people, then I can send individual messages to them. And mm-hmm. there's some things that you can do. And some people don't like DMs, but I don't care whether you like them or not. They work. And so it's a good tool to have. Um, on metrics, a new tool I'm watching pop up. Um, you know, 
Uh, I mean, there's just, there's a lot of these tools, and a lot of them are free. This isn't a listening tool per se, but what do you think about clout? There's a lot of these um, new platforms or new tools that are trying to measure, you know, all this different stuff. So what's your... I like the concept. I actually like a company called Cred better, K-R-E-D. And the reason I like it, I like their algorithms and the way in which they build it. I also like their politics, meaning I don't like some of the things that Cloud has done. In my opinion, a little too pushy, a little too spammy. Um, and I think that's, that's, that, you know, that's your brand. You know, a brand is two things. One, in what we say in South Dakota, where I'm from, it's something you put on a a horse or a cow, yeah. because that's where brands got started, the, the visual representation of an image that right. says this belongs to so-and-so, and then the brand is nothing but a promise delivered. So I think they're going to have a tough time delivering the promise, but I actually like Cred. I'm, I utilize Cred. I'm thinking about doing some more with that company um, because I just really like it. it. It tells me, you know, when I was at a, a big Fortune 100 company, the teams would come to me and say, well, here's the ranking of all of our bloggers, and we are going to put some money behind these people because they're, they're credible. All right. Yeah. How do I know that? Because yeah. they have the most followers, because they're the loudest, because of the, the skinniest, the fattest. I don't know. Yeah. So so tools like cred tell me who are the most important. And then things like I like got an example, like people browser, I was talking to a one big brand like Adidas. And, you know, here they're spending all their money on athletes. Yet we found out by the tools that their number one audience for, you know, getting and disseminating information that's most credible were musicians. Hmm. So that's a great way of being able to use a tool to find out, oh, I thought this, but it's really this. Now I need to shift my money over to this kind of activity. And again, very inexpensive to do. When you were at Kodak, did you have to have that ROI discussion? I mean, this is no, something that we're always <laughs> still wrestling with. It's a bunch of crap for a lot of it. And I'll say that. Yeah. Um, and I talk about this. I, the way I say that, I mean, it's important. I mean, come on. It's like when you're in meetings, you know, you'll say, let's drive some sales. And then the CFO will go, oh, excuse me, Jeff. Uh, let's drive profitable sales. Yeah. Like, is there any other freaking kind of sales? I mean, no, I want to drive sales with no profit. Please, give me a break. Yeah. You know, so the ROI question, they'll come to you and say, what's your return on investment? I say, here's the real ROI. What's your return on ignoring? Because if you're engaged with your customers, if you're in the relationship with your customers, and you have an operation that's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing, then you're driving profitable relations. So you're talking about the opportunity lost. Yes, well, say, yeah. without question. I mean, if all you're doing, you know, sometimes it costs you money to get some customers. I mean, we all know that. I'd rather take the good customers I have from that I have today and mine more out of them. There's That's an easier and better margin kind of activity. Yeah. But we don't always have that ability. So if we've got to get new clients and new customers, you only have to... You have to advertise. Is there always a return on investment, all that stuff? No. Can you measure it? Yeah, eventually, but why spend all of the time doing it when you know in your gut that if I do a press release and it gets noticed and picked up by X number or if I get people talking about me online amongst 50 million or 5,000 or 50, it's good. So what's wrong with that? Yeah. I, you know, so it's just a matter of that's, that's what leadership's about in a company, and that's what they should be doing is leading rather than you know, getting into those kind of minutiae. How'd you guys figure out the media mix? I'm just curious. I want to go into a little bit more detail about that. So maybe people watching are, you know, hey, Facebook, or nearly at a billion people. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. I had to be on Facebook. But not, but not always right. Not but necessarily. But, but not right? always right for everybody. Yeah. I mean, I, I got to be honest with you. Even in my own stuff with the book and everything else, I was not concerned. I did not think Facebook was right for me. Yeah. I've since learned that's not been the case because we're getting great activations. So how did you find that book. out? By really listening and doing the stuff and, and, and getting past my own stupidity. Uh, which I think a lot of entrepreneurs have to. And I talk about this as one of the biggest failures for most entrepreneurs, most leaders. Leaders, let's take leaders, is fear of being a beginner. And yet, so I thought I knew everything. And so my team kept saying, no, 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 the real engagement's here. And they showed me through Facebook, and now our, our fans are soaring. These are the most engaged that I've got, and, and we're seeing sales come from that. So, it, you know, you just really have to get in there and test. Just a big brand or, a, you know, a small brand yeah. in terms of size. I'm talking about brands of size. You, you really have to just get in there and test and play around. It's about a blend, quite frankly. It's, yeah. You can't say just go put everything on social media. I mean, I had a, at a big CMO event one time. Someone said, well, we're moving all of our budget into social media. I'm going, How? doesn't cost anything for the most part. Yeah. So how are you moving all your costs there? But yeah, there are expenditures there. So, I, you know, it's really a, you just have to really try it out, play with it, and find out what works. You know, people say print's dead. Well, that's stupid. It's not dead. It's still very effective. It just depends on what kind. If your audience is there, why not? Right? Exactly yeah. right. And, if you, you know, right now, quite frankly, I can get through with a direct mail letter easier than I can with an email because most marketers have screwed up email. 
So, so if I can use a 13 to 1 ratio on a direct mail piece, for every dollar I put in, I get 13 back. Well, that's a pretty good re result. So you just want to be able to play with that. So you're recommending some sort of hybrid, um, some sort of, I don't know, diversified portfolio, so to speak. Well, yeah, I mean, for some people, radio is still good. I mean, for some people, television broadcast is still good. For some, it just depends on what you're, where, where it best resonates with your audience and then be able to find that match. And that's, that's the science of it, you know. But there is a little bit of an art to figure it out until you get to the science of understanding what works. For the bigger brands watching this, give us an idea of the percentage of budget. So at Kodak, for example, what kind of money were you putting towards social media in a percentage? Oh, social media is minute. It's a rounding error. I mean, seriously, for social media, because it just doesn't cost as much. Yeah. The real thing is in the people. What I did was redid the team around what I called convergence media. So what I my belief is the stuff that you do offline you should do online stuff you do online you should do offline meaning you should blend it and, and step and repeat the messages wherever possible yeah. because then you've got a cohesive theme and not try to change the themes every month week or whatever but really stick to a couple of campaigns per year and then then be able to to activate and leverage from that so from a percentage of the, it was minute I mean you know when you're talking about a 17 billion dollar budget you know to go out and spend you know fifty thousand dollars for this tool or that tool it's not that much although don't get me wrong fifty thousand dollars is fifty thousand dollars and I still looked at it when I was at, at a major fortune 100 company like that where people would bring to me and say well Jeff this only cost you know a million dollars I'm going I don't know where you're from but a million dollars is a lot of money yeah. And so you have to just take a look at what the value that you're going to bring back. You guys did a lot of blogger outreach too, right, at Kodak? Right? Absolutely. In fact, I was uh, named the very first chief blogger ever. I'm, I'm, I'm real happy about certain things that we did there that were very innovative, even though the company's in some pretty tough shape now. But, you know, I named the very first chief blogger ever, I named the very first chief listening officer. In fact, I even coined the term twanker online for people who use bad form on Twitter. And now it's being applied to a lot of different people. But, nice. I like that. Yeah, well, Twanker's a good word. I, I crowdsource that, you know. And then, then I did things like, you know, we talk about in the book Running the Gauntlet, friend sourcing, which is another key concept that we're seeing right now with people that, that, that you know, source their friends to, to make decisions for. So let's dive into the book a little bit. Running the Gauntlet, so backing up just a little bit, um, you talked about this literal gauntlet 1824 or, or, or 2012 it's running a gauntlet when you I mean it's like being captured by the Shoshone Indians and you know strip naked and told to run down a parallel line where they beat you and hit you with sticks and then yeah. if you say if you get through you're free yeah. you know and that's the way it is in corporate America that's the yeah. way it isn't in, even in small companies though too quite frankly yeah. everybody's there there's all these eight naysayers opportunists obstructionists who are standing in your way and yeah. all these people like the gauntlet who think that they have some way of saying you can't do what you're going to do now I, when I started reading that uh, I immediately felt like we were soulmates uh, because I w I've been there before I got this gig I was in corporate America and I, f I completely you know felt your pain and I know exactly what you're talking about when you talk but about you, but you get that in your small business though too don't you I guess uh, a lot less you yeah know, it's less uh, but you still have people who think well we can't afford that we can't do that did I ask you if we could afford it right you know I remember I talked to my own team personally I said I need to get our followers up to here I need to do this because if we're going to be seen as a social media leader don't you think we should have you know, some really cool things going on. And they said, well, we can't do that based on our budget. I said, did I give you a budget? Did I tell you you can't spend that money? Yeah. Show me what you can do and then turn, turn it loose. And it's about freeing people. But, you know, that gauntlet that, you know, you ran at corporate America. I mean, you were probably given permission to do this or this or this. And you started doing it. And then all these people came out and said, oh, from over, way over here. Yeah. And said, no, we can't do it. Well, you know, there's lawyers, there's HR people, there's great, great people out there. But, you know, there are people that try to trip you up along the way. And oh, I used to have, well, I was the best thing at corporate corporate America for, for lawyers. I was their job security. Are you kidding me? I mean, they used to follow me around everywhere because I would say something. They would be like, oh my gosh, did you hear what he said today? You know, the, you know, our job as leaders, as entrepreneurs or as corporate leaders, is to take everybody from the center of the table and move them to the edge or the center of the stage to, and move them to the edge of the stage, right on the abyss. That's our job. Stretch them, push them. And the lawyers and the, you know, and the legal or an HR and all those, one, and they're wonderful people. Don't Rule keepers, wrong. yeah. They, they, you need we, them. They, we love them. I mean, I do, all right? Uh, you should just keep them in a room and then bring them out every so often yeah. but, uh, or call them is better. And, but for the most part, they, they think they, they should pull everybody back. I mean, that's what they really think. And so they try to pull people back. And I go, that's not your job. Your job is to keep me from falling off the edge. And, and you have to really get down to these what I call conditions of satisfaction with them to really say, look, that's not your job. I'll, I'll do respect. 
It's my decision whether we take that business risk or not. Your decision is how much trouble will I get in if I do push it, if I do do it? Will we get sued? Will we, you know, will we find trouble? Will, you know, how do we, how do we protect privacy of, the, of our customers? How do we do this? How do we do that? That's your job is to protect us and tell me how I can do it not that whether or not I can, because that's that's the business leader's decision to do that. I like this conditions of satisfaction idea, and you talk about individuals should establish this for themselves, and also companies should do it. For me, it was the greatest breakthrough I've ever had in any company or, that I've worked in, and, and me personally, quite frankly. Yeah. And it really, it's about promises. Conditions of satisfaction are promises. Promises that you need to deliver, which is relates to your brand yeah. of who you are. And so in everything that we do, there's a there's a performer and there's a customer. And even in our personal relationships with our wives, our family, you know, I make a promise to my kids to take them to Disney World. It wasn't a hint. They say, Dad, you promised. Yeah. See, and so I talk about promises and how important promises are. Not a forecast, a promise. Yeah. And so when I have a good sales team, I want to promise. I don't want to forecast. You can forecast all you want, but I want to know what exactly you're going to bring in. Yeah, do what you say you're going to do. Do what you're going to do. And so this talks about, and in the book, I talk about what that action cycle looks like. And I don't care whether you got one employee or you got 100 employees or 10 or 20 or 50,000. It's the same. Well, tell us how to do it then. So it's, it's what you want to do. It's your goal set, really, right? right? So it's really about me saying, hey, look, I have something I want. You know, I'll go to McDonald's and I want a sandwich, right? And I pull up to McDonald's. We have an applied agreement that I order my food. I drive up to the first window. I pay my money. They take my money. That's an implied agreement. I pull up to the second window, and they should be giving me my food. But that doesn't always happen. Pretty soon, a 14-year-old assistant manager comes over, knocks on the window, and says, it's not quite ready. Would you pull up over here to this little spot? And I'll say, what are you talking about? They said, well, it's not ready. We'll have to, you'll have to wait over here. And I go, wait, wait, that wasn't our promise. And I said, you didn't renegotiate the conditions of satisfaction, so therefore, if you haven't, I'm going to stay right where I'm at. And so I, I roll my window up. Pretty soon, the 16-year-old manager comes over and knocks on the window. And then we go through the same thing. I said, look, you're not offering me anything in, you know, in exchange for breaking your promise. So no McShake or McMinty Shake or Apple Pie or Big Fries. So, yeah. so therefore, I'm going to wait. And, you know, and it's about changing the conditions of satisfaction. So you can change those conditions of satisfaction, but you made a promise to me that you were going to deliver it. And I want that experience when you said you were going to do it. And if you're not, then we're going to renegotiate the promise. And so it's about that relationship, either with vendors or with customers or even your own family. So you advocate writing these down? I mean, where, do you publish yeah, do. them? Do you we let do. people know? In, in, our own, in our own company, we use a Hoshin process. It's a way of which we you know, deliver our plans. And so we use a plan of, of, of promises. You can call it an annual plan. You can call it you know, quarterly goals. You can do all those. But in our operation and the way we work with our clients and driving high growth, we really sit down with you and we talk about what are the conditions of satisfaction. So exactly how many press releases do you want? How many not much news coverage do you want to get? You know, if we're working a PR side or, or, or customers or how many mentions do you want to get? So we focus on that and we drive those promises pretty hard. So, Do you think this is, uh, for people who are hiring people, do you think this is important? question to maybe have new employees think about like what are your conditions of satisfaction i don't i don't know that i, I would say what are your goals you know i do want to know what their goals are and i don't think they'd understand what condition i hope someday everybody understands what a condition of satisfaction is yeah. then i'll be very successful but um but i think if you talk about what their goals are and what they want out of it and then how you can help them deliver on those goals and then based on that they need to do things for you to deliver to get to those goals yeah. you know i sit down with my employees and say what are you what do you want out of life what do you want to get from this job and, that, and we talk about their conditions of satisfaction and then and then I talk about mine and and we're you know try to be very clear you know and, and I have to constantly and even in my own operation you know focus on being a great customer like you know you're late and I have a complaint you know or thank you you know I'm satisfied I'm, I'm extremely satisfied with what you're doing and how you're doing it delivering on time but but high performance teams that's the way high performance teams operate they, everyone knows they have an, a, an implied job, and you count on them to, you know, in a football team, to make the block, to make the catch, to make the pass, or whatever it might be. And, and if you have people breaking their promises, you're getting sacked. And, and you're not afraid to fire people. You talk about in the book, I like this, don't be afraid to fire people, you know, fire fast, uh, but also don't be afraid to fire yourself. Yeah. Talk about that for a second. Yeah, many times. I mean, there are things I shouldn't do in the operation. I just should not do. And I'm constantly getting into the middle of things. And I need to step back in my own company of saying no. Because, you know, because I like, I mean, I actually like cleaning up the front steps. I like 
doing those things, but is that the best use of my time? I sometimes can write a press release better than anybody else or write copy better, but should I be doing that, you know? And so you have to fi fire yourself sometimes from getting out of those things and do what you're supposed to be doing for the better of the business because if it's like everything's like, uh, I don't know, my pen, I, I pointed out, but like a seesaw, you push on one side, it's got to give on the other side. Yeah. And so that's what happens with your time, and that's you only have so much of it, so you better make good use of it. You're consulting for other companies. Now, is this kind of a trend that you see happening with big and small companies? Basically, people unable to get out of their own way? Oh, it's all, it's constant. It's yeah. constant. We, we, we get very introverted, and so you just have to help them with the breakthroughs and really focus in on the goals of the company, the, the conditions of satisfaction. If you get people focused in on those things, then everything else drops to the side. You know, we, we get into what I call stories about things all the time in our businesses where, oh, I can't. It's a story. You know, yeah. we're afraid to be that beginner. We're afraid, we're afraid to push through our fear of that first three or four seconds or talking about the elephants in the room. And Yeah, well, we get stuck, I think, and then um, there's a stigma attached to, to failure and in corporate America. Wow. Come on. I mean, everyone wants to blame somebody else, who blame, right? Who, blame yourself. Blame. Who cares? Blame. All right, I'm, I'm responsible. You screw up? Okay, blame me. I don't care. I mean, I mean so I talk about this in the book, Running the Gauntlet. What's going to happen if you make a mistake? Come on. You're an entrepreneur running an operation. Yeah. If, you, if you're not operating heavy equipment and you're not doing brain surgery, what's the worst that's going to happen? Well, I like it's this idea. I'm with you. But let me play the other side of the coin. So in this economy, people are hunkered down. You know, everyone's losing their job. The economy sucks. Um, I think that's what people feel is at stake. If they make a mistake, they're next on the chopping block. They're, but they're, I, I got that. But yeah. no one's going to die. Yeah. Oh, hey, come on. That, that's my biggest point in this thing. So take yeah. the risk. Right now is the time to start acting. Right now is the time to be aggressive. Right now is the time to do something different and move out. I mean, look at some companies. They're soaring. Yeah. Not every company is sucking right now. Yeah. Okay? Well. There's a lot of great companies that are, you know, our own included, that are growing at two, three hundred percent. Well, why? Well, it's because you're focused in on the things that you're supposed to be doing rather than worrying about all that crap. I, everyone keeps telling me about the bad economy. I know it's there, okay? I don't see it because I'm looking for the companies that want to grow fast, high growth, and focus on getting those things done. So I don't see that, you know, but there are, I know there are companies that are like that. So it's about what do you want to do? And if, even if it is bad, all right, get over it. Yeah. Move on. The central theme throughout the whole book is about being an agent of change. I love that. Um, who did you write the book for? Did you write it for the top? Did you write it for the bottom, the middle? You know, I always write it for me, probably more than anything. If you know, um, but I, I write it for leaders. And whether you're at a big fortune, it doesn't make a difference. Wall Street, Main Street, it doesn't make a difference. And and so I always write it with entrepreneurs in mind. But entrepreneurs are in major corporations, and they're just leaders. They're yeah. leaders in companies. So I really try to write it for business leaders. But I mean, I've had a lot of people tell me it's a self-help book too. So that they've read read through it and said it's helped me with my own personal relationship with my spouse, which is that's kind of a nice thing to hear too. But but really, I write it for leaders of businesses, and it doesn't make a difference what size. Jeff, I appreciate uh, spending the time with you. It's been great. A pleasure. Thank you very much. We've been talking with Jeff Hazlett, author of the book Running the Gauntlet. This is Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Thanks. This Behind the Brand episode is brought to you by Raven Internet Marketing Tools, powerful data and tools for online marketers. Get a free trial at raventools.com slash behind.